So, I have a confession. I love Batman. How embarrassing. No, my favorite superhero is not some cool, under-the-radar pick like Animal Man or John Constantine. Boy, would that be cool. It's actually the most popular superhero in the whole world that pretty much everyone and their mother loves. It's just... I don't... You're cool. I bet you can't guess my second favorite one, though. But it's true, I love Batman. I love Batman movies, even the bad ones. I'm currently replaying all the Arkham games. I like it all. Wouldn't call myself, like, a Batman expert or anything, but, you know, I'm, I'm pretty deep into Batman. I know my stuff. I may have, uh, picked up a Batman comic once. I've read The Dark Knight Returns. I even watch Batman shows, which is kind of a bummer, honestly, because it's been a long, long time since you've had a proper Batman man show on the air, and even longer since we've had one that's been considered great. Donut. Gah, get that away from me! Is it poison? It's chocolate. Mmm. With respect to the Batman 2004 and Batman the Brave and the Bold, which I am quite fond of, the latter by the way, you pretty much have to go all the way back to Batman the Animated Series to find a Batman show that's been universally beloved. And I don't know if you've been keeping track, but that show is 32 years old, okay? It's, uh, been a hot minute. That show can almost run for president, which is why, if you're someone like me who cares a whole lot about Batman media, the announcement of this year's Batman Cape Crusader was a pretty big deal. And not just because it's a new Batman show or that it has big names like J.J. Abrams and Matt Reeves attached to it, all that's fine and good. But, the real reason to get excited about this show was one name and one name only, Bruce Timm. The main architect of not just Batman the Animated Series, but the whole DCAU run, which for my money is the best single stretch of adapted superhero media ever produced. And, uh, you know, also Batman and Harley Quinn. Ugh, holy. It's not so bad. Smells like discipline. To me, there's just nothing that comes close to that era in that universe. Not any live-action DC movies, not the MCU, nothing, nada. It's just this perfect run of shows and movies that have such a deep understanding of the characters, the world, the right tone, incredible new stories, and new iconic characters. I mean, I could gush about the DCAU all day, and maybe one day I will. It's just that good. Well, you know, for the most part. Sometimes, you know, we make mistakes. And I am by no means alone in that thinking. Far from it. If you were someone who was really into superhero media, hearing names like Bruce Timm, Paul Dini, and Alan Burnett attached to new stuff really does mean something. I mean, for some people, they are borderline mythical figures, especially people like Paul Dini and Bruce Timm. There are a few people that have had a bigger impact on DC Comics in the past 30 years than those two. Plus, it's just been so long since any of them have stepped back into producing a proper series TV show. So, when I saw the news that Bruce Timm was heading up a brand spanking new Batman TV adaptation, I was all in, baby. I mean, how can I not be? It was being talked about as the successor to Batman the Animated Series, which comes with a certain amount of very high expectations. There's just no way that it couldn't. I mean, that show is not only one of the best animated shows ever made, but one of the best shows ever made. And I really mean that, too. What it was able to accomplish in the restrictive, heavily censored landscape of of 90s kids television is nothing short of a miracle. Gene McCurdy promised me I'd have guns and I'd have fist fights because I wouldn't come over otherwise. And I didn't believe her. I really didn't. And, and then they had a trailer and those guns are going off and fists are hitting and it's great. It overachieves more than any show I can think of, especially given the circumstances of when it was made. So, to say that Cape Crusader had a whole lot to live up to is quite the understatement. Virtually everyone who was going to watch it was coming in because of the legacy of the animated series. That show means a whole lot to a whole lot of people. And you know, that's what happens when you put a name like Bruce Tim front and center. As long as that man is doing his job with two hands, you're expecting to get some quality entertainment. You know what I mean by that. Stop it. Get some help. So, the question is, boys and girls, did it live up to its impossible expectations? No. 
It's not the animated series, nothing ever will be. But I think that's why it actually works and why I think I kind of love it. It's not my favorite piece of Batman media out there, that would obviously be the Pete Holmes Batman, but it's very, very good and has so much potential. And I'll get into a whole bunch of reasons why, but I think chief among them is that it didn't just try to run back that same tired formula from the animated series, which they very easily could have done. You could have just gone to all the old producers and directors and writers and artists and anyone who had even the slightest bit to do with that show and just thrown all the money at them to produce essentially a legacy season four of that show. And if they did, fans would love it, the show would do well, everyone would cash in, and you know, that would be that. And I'm not gonna sit here and pretend that I would be above enjoying that too, because of course I would. I mean, who among us doesn't want to see the return of the Condiment King? I knew you'd catch up to me sooner or later. How I've relished this meeting. And while that route would be safe and fine and nostalgic, it too would have no chance of living up to its own legacy. Beyond nostalgia, it likely wouldn't have much to offer, even if the whole crew was back together. Like all things, that show is a product of its time. So, instead of just playing it safe and going down that road, Cape Crusader opts to build on the legacy of the animated series by taking that style and tone and feel and going in, I think, a pretty bold new direction. I mean, if I had one word to describe this show, it would be bold, which doesn't mean every choice and every change and everything this show does is good, but there is no denying that the team who made this had some pretty big Mondo Burger sized balls. It might look like your standard run-of-the-mill Batman show, but they take some pretty big swings, which in this current bland era of nostalgia bukkake, I found very admirable. The show has a strong, clear vision and is not afraid to take Take risks to make it work. Rachel! Batman! Rachel! Now, throughout this video, I will be making many comparisons to the animated series, which, no, is not fair, because as I said, the show goes in its own unique direction, and they aren't even trying to do the same things or appeal to the same audiences. But, I think comparing the two actually can highlight what makes this new adaptation work so well and worthy of existing in a world that already has so much Batman content in it. I mean, us Batman fans, for all the whining we can do about this thing and that thing, rightfully so sometimes. We gotta admit that, generally, we eat pretty good. Much more so than virtually any other fans of any superhero. I mean, just imagine yourself for just a minute that you are a huge fan of The Flash, and like 10 years ago, you see that a Flash movie is finally in development for the exciting new DCEU. At long last, Barry Allen, your favorite superhero, is finally gonna be on the silver screen. And then years go by, and delay, after delay, after delay, happens, and the pile of terrible, embarrassing DC movies grows, and Ezra Miller gets outed as a complete asshole, and then 2023 finally comes around, and the movie comes out, and this is what you get. Yeah. I'm Batman. And a year later, this deranged meme is the only lasting legacy of the only Flash movie out there. It can get pretty rough out there, fellas, okay? Anyway though, as far as comparing the animated series and Cape Crusader, you kind of have to do it. Cape Crusader bucks so many of the trends set by things like the animated series that you kind of have to bring it up to show what's so different and unique about it. I mean, Bruce Timm even directly says that much of what Cape Crusader is, is ideas and concepts he had for the animated series, but just couldn't do. We done Justice League, so we got together and we're throwing ideas back and forth and the subject of Batman kept coming up. We didn't want to just go back and do Batman the Animated Series again and directly compete with stuff we did 30 years ago, but in thinking back on it, there was a whole bunch of stuff I didn't get to do the first time that I could do this time. When I originally pitched BTAS back in 1990, it was pretty different than what ended up on screen. The more I thought about it, it was more of a pulp, serial, mystery, film noir show rather than having to make it accessible to seven-year-olds and make the toy company happy. You see, quotes like that from Bruce 
against him make comparing these two almost impossible to avoid because in many ways this new show is Tim's response to his own work, what he would have done if he wasn't making a show for a young audience and had full control. But what does that actually mean? What about Cape Crusader makes it more of Tim's vision? Well, some very obvious examples are in the way in which the show is presented. It maintains the same dark fairy tale noir look that mixes 1930s suits and hats and Tommy guns and old school Hollywood vibes with a sprinkle of modern technology to give it this weird timeless fantasy feel. That lack of a clear time period makes everything seem that much more mysterious and fantastical, like you've been whisked away to some strange new world that exists without time. All of that is great and stays from BTAS, and actually is leaned further into, but the most notable structural change is in the fact that the show is now serialized, which is, I think, the real big swing this show takes. While yes, all 10 episodes can be enjoyed in a vacuum and follow a similar episodic structure, the season itself is tied together through a few consistent through lines and plot threads. There is one loose, overarching narrative, almost like a five hour long movie in the vein of a story like Year One, where we're seeing the development of Batman's first few months in Gotham, seeing how he evolves and adapts and gains allies, how Gordon and company deal with the rampant corruption in the city, how a few of the rogues tragically get their start as supervillains. All these elements weave together to form one single nightmarish vision of Gotham, setting the stage for a season two to operate under a more traditional status quo for Batman, where he's more experienced, already in with Gordon and the cops and many of his villains are already at large. Who are you? Catwoman, dear. Obviously. What can I say? You inspire me. The show is also clearly trying to go for a much more mature tone than the animated series, highlighting the grit and grime of Gotham in a way that's simply not possible for something aimed at kids. And holy goat nipples Batman, they take full advantage. I mean, not to say that the show is throwing out f-bombs and cutting people's heads off. I mean, a kid could watch this just fine, but they aren't afraid to rock the boat and do some pretty wild stuff. He was my favorite. Guess that makes you my favorite now. Real named characters bite it in this show. Events that would play out with Batman saving the day in the animated series end in ways that are often pretty shocking. The serialized narrative allows them to shake things up and kill some people off where an episodic format would force them to keep all the villains and major named characters in rotation for future one-off appearances. Which to be clear, worked great in BTAS because you would eagerly wait until the next time you would see your favorite bad guys, which was awesome. Awesome, but in a serialized show, that doesn't really work. In order for a serialized show to work, you need character deaths and major ongoing changes and shakeups to the status quo. So, that simple structural change totally opens up the possibilities for storytelling because you don't always know how an episode is going to play out. Oftentimes, it could end like how you would expect, where Batman beats the bad guys and saves a day. Other times, though, something totally unexpected could happen that then leads into more compelling plot threads down the line. Yes, sir, Mr. Mayor. Let me take a wild guess. Was that about us? Granted, this is not like some uh, bold new experimental way of making television. In fact, most shows these days are serialized, but this is the first time we are seeing this applied to a serious major Batman adaptation, and I think it fits Tim's vision perfectly, allowing the show to have longer storylines and mysteries and season-long villains. It feeds so well into that noir style too, where the animated series could only dip its toes into the old film noir tone, Cape Crusader dives headfirst into it making it the glue that holds the show together. Everything from the designs and the origins of the villains to the way Batman is shot is all inspired from that vintage black and white tone. Hell, I bet if he could, Tim would have made the whole show black and white. And you know, if it was, it wouldn't be half bad. I mean, just watch the intro and you'll get a pretty nice taste of what that could look like. Just saying, might be worth looking into, especially since the animation does uh, leave quite a bit to be desired. Spoke to him again yesterday. He still can't remember a thing from the attack. 
The area though, where you see the most impact of that noir style is not Gotham City or the way everyone looks and sounds, but actually the character of Batman himself. It's a part of the show that will likely turn some people off in a major way, but to me I thought it worked really well. Batman in this is quite a bit different than what we usually get with an animated Batman. Usually in stuff like this, Batman is shown to be, of course, dark and brooding and, you know, a little bit edgy, but he also usually comes off like a fairly nice guy with a heart even if he doesn't always show it. More stubborn and closed off than he is actually deeply flawed and traumatized. I don't have time to pursue a relationship. My work is too important to allow any distractions. Diana's a remarkable woman. She's a valued friend. She's standing right behind me, isn't she? It's just the nature of animated shows generally aimed at a young audience. He's going to have fun, lighthearted moments and come off more human than, say, the movie adaptations that just can't help themselves but make him as dark and edgy as possible. But even in those, he still at times comes off like a normal guy with normal guy goals like smooching hot ladies. I mean, that's pretty much what like half of all the live action Batman care about. And don't even get me started on Penguin. Yuck. I like to fill her void. But in Cape Crusader, Tim chooses to depict Batman as a genuinely weird guy, and I love it. He's not a very likable character, which, like a lot of things in this show, yet again stemmed from ideas Tim had left on the cutting room floor for the animated series. Batman's not just scary looking with his bat costume, but he's odd, personality-wise. He's not friendly, he's very remote, doesn't talk much. That was the version I pitched to writers, but everybody had a hard time wrapping their heads around around that character. They eventually made Batman more human than I would have liked. Now, that was definitely a good choice to not go with that type of Bruce Wayne for the animated series because that's just not the vibe of that show. But here, I think it just further cements that classic noir tone. They're going to pay. They? All of them. I'm going to make them pay. And you're going to help me. Unlike past Batman adaptations, Batman is not shown in very many close-ups, often cloaked in shadow or shown from a distance, never allowing the audience to get in his head or get comfortable with him. The contrast between Bruce Wayne and Batman is less charming and more kind of creepy and off-putting. How is therapy, Master Bruce? Waste of an hour. Doctor thinks she can get into my head. That's not gonna happen. It's not just the cliché of Bruce Wayne being the true mask for Batman, it's much darker and weirder than that. He seems almost like an alien in some scenes, where he will change in and out of his Batman voice the instant he doesn't have to come off normal. He even seems to actively dread every moment he has to be Bruce Wayne, often just using that persona as a way of doing Batman work with no regard for other people. That's another reason I brought you out. I thought it might help you to talk about the, uh, the incident with a friend. The only person he's truly himself around is Alfred, and he treats him with such a cold, uncaring attitude that it really makes you question how good a person Bruce is. He doesn't seem to treat anybody with a shred of respect. Not Alfred, not Harvey, not his psychiatrist, no one. Like a lot of early year Batman stories, he's driven a lot more by rage and vengeance than a real sense of altruism. It's very similar to the Bruce Wayne we get in Matt Reeves's The Batman, which for my money is the very best Batman adaptation out there, so I am kind of predisposed to liking this more abrasive Bruce Wayne. I know some people have a problem with this kind of Batman, especially how he goes so far as to call Alfred by his last name only until like the end of the season, which I totally understand since this is a character that we all feel like we've known for a long time and seeing him be less human and, you know, kind of a dick is uncomfortable and off-putting. Plus, that's also not who Batman always is is in the comics, but I think that's kind of how you have to show him in this kind of show. A person like Bruce Wayne that does what he does is simply not a normal person. He wouldn't be friendly or likable, especially in his early years as a crime fighter. Now he could mellow out down the line as he ages and gets a few Robins and meets people that challenge his ideals and uh, accidentally has a kid with the daughter of a genocidal eco-terrorist, whoopsies. But for a story like this, you kind of need a Batman that 
that's an asshole and a bit scary in that he doesn't seem to be quite human. It makes those few emotional moments we do get from him hit that much harder because you know that deep down he is a good person that feels empathy and wants to help people and he can show it but it's just buried in mountains of trauma and hidden behind a mask that's meant to scare people. He is a deeply disturbed person which is a kind of odd character you need to match a setting like the noir Gotham. Pretty much every classic noir protagonist is strange in some way or at least some down on their luck drunk loser so making Batman a distant weird stranger fits perfectly. He just opts to wear a bat suit and cape as opposed to a trench coat and a hat. Your friendship with Dr. Quinzel made you reckless. You should have left when shut I- Shut up. Just shut up. Point being, in Gotham, no one is normal. Not this guy, not that guy, not this lady, certainly not him. It's a bizarre dark fairy tale and you need a bizarre dark hero to go with it. And while I'm on topic, I gotta say that this direction with Batman only works because of the incredible performance of Hamish Linklater. If you haven't seen the Netflix miniseries Midnight Mass he was in, go watch that because A, that show is fucking incredible and B, he is so goddamn good in it that you will be sold on him as an actor. Which is why I was actually really psyched to hear that he would be the new voice of Batman. The different voices he slips in and out of make Bruce seem like such a disturbed, strange person. I was thinking about what you said earlier. About seeing Dr. Quinzel. The coffee's cold. I'll get you a fresh cup, sir. Even as Bruce Wayne, you can sense that there is just something off with him by how he sounds almost robotically normal. He always sounds like he's hiding something. So the Duchess says, no, not on the first date. <laughs> oh, for Pete's sake. Guess I can't hold my liquor. Be right back. And as terrible as it is that we no longer have Kevin Conroy, I don't think he would have worked well for this specific kind of Batman show, if for no other reason than we all feel so comfortable with his voice. He can't come off weird and off-putting and unlikable because he is Batman. So having a totally new guy take the role allows the show to make Batman feel like more of a stranger. You pretty much had to get someone new, and Linklater does a great job. Tonally, it fits like a glove. Those photos of you might prove to be more trouble than Catwoman was. Probably, but now they'll all know I'm coming for them. He's one of the very best parts of the show, on top of the style and the tone and the narrative and the character of Bruce Wayne and the noir Gotham. It just all blends together to form this perfect singular vision. I also really came to love the Golden Age inspired looks. Fabulous, right? Not the word I would use. All that forms such a strong foundation to build the story on, and for the most part, they knock that part out of the park. But before we get to the main narrative, we have to talk about the one part of the show that I think does fall a bit flat. The villains. Bang. Now, as we all know, a Batman story is not always, but almost always, only as good as the villain. I mean, he's kind of famous for having the very best rogues gallery in all comics. You just got hit after hit coming out the wazoo. Joker, Harley Quinn, Two-Face, Penguin, Riddler, Scarecrow, Mr. Freeze, Catwoman, Poison Death Ivy, Stroke, Bane, Killer Croc, Ray Shadow, Red Ghoul, Hood, Joel Shoemacher, The Court of Owls, Hush, Hush, Black Mask, Mask Solomon Mad Grundy, Hatter, Victor Zaz, Zaz, Pig, Man Bat, Fire, Ventriloquist, Phantasm, Condiment, King, Calendar Man, Block King, Killer Mob, Shiva, Man, Rat Gentleman Catch, Ghost, Rupert, Crazy Storm, Will, Maxi Zeus, Copper, I Want to Be Young, Salvatore Falcon, Owlman. I mean, there is quite literally an infinite amount of these wackos, and like most superhero villains outside of the very top tier, many of them are stupid ideas for characters that should not work, but they so often do because the character of Batman and his world just naturally lends itself very well to villains. There I was, holed up in this quarry. When Batman came nosing around, he was getting closer, closer. And? I threw a rock at him. They can reflect dark sides of his personality, challenge not just his strength but his intelligence, fit in with the overflowing amount of bad guys loose in Gotham at any given time, which itself is a fun part of Batman, and also have plenty of time to shine since Batman is generally not a man of many words. They can always take center stage. Remember, you are my number one. 
Gotham is a place just dripping with potential for both silly and serious villains alike. You can stick damn near any dumbass concept for a villain in there against Batman and make it work pretty well. And as such, most Batman adaptations lean heavily on those characters to carry the narratives. In fact, it's often one of the biggest criticisms of those adaptations where the villain is just infinitely more interesting than Batman himself see the Dark Knight. They're the kinds of roles that just lend themselves very well to fun, over-the-top, show-stealing performances, so they always stand out. This is perhaps the area where the animated series shine the most and why it's still considered great to this day. The villains stole damn near every episode of that show with their colorful looks and talented voice actors. Many of them were fleshed out in ways that had never been done before that made so many of them feel so tragic and made you empathize with them so much. Much. Like, there are some genuinely emotional episodes of that show that are so sad because of the tragedy of the villains. Heart of Ice, Two Face, Baby Doll, Mad Love, Second Chance. I mean, they really had them down to a science, and it only continued into the greater DCAU. Think of it, Batman. To never again walk on a summer's day with a hot wind in your face and a warm hand to hold. Oh, yes. I'd kill for that. Cape Crusader, though, just doesn't quite get there with them. And to be fair, I think a lot of that is intentional, not in the sense that they're bad on purpose, but more of that it's just not the main focus of the show. Unlike virtually every other Batman adaptation, Cape Crusader does not lean on the villains pretty much at all. They still serve the same function in the story and take up a good chunk of screen time, but the star of the show is the noir Gotham first and Batman second, and the main villains in season one are actually the correct up cops more than any traditional costume bad guys, again a lot like year one. The usual villains are still there, but they really aren't all that important. More of window dressing and easy touchstones to hang the main narrative off of. Existing more as one-off bad guys or mini bosses to the real villain of the show being Thorn and the corrupt cops. And I don't necessarily have an issue with going down that route, but not having the villains be as fun and colorful and and at the forefront does make the show feel like it's just missing something. Batman kind of needs his villains to work. It's an essential part of Batman that you do feel the loss of when it's not there, and unfortunately, you feel that for most of the run of the show, even when you have whole episodes dedicated to them. I have realized it was perfect casting all along. Villain is the part I was born to play. Now, to be fair, they do hit on a few of them. I think the Catwoman episode, for example, is a pretty good one-off villain origin where you see her contend with Batman and eventually get her comeuppance. It's light and fun and maintains that same flirty dynamic with them that works so well. Same goes for the Two-Face two-part finale. You know, you're really no fun at all. No, I'm not. All the other ones though, even if the characters are done well, all lack that special something. None of them have that tragic emotional heart that was so often found in the animated series. Clayface, for example, I think has this great old school Hollywood horror movie inspired episode, which is awesome, but they remove any tragedy with him and have him go full old school movie villain, which of course works in the context of the episode, but doesn't make him a character you feel much for, which you most certainly did in the animated series. What in heaven's name do they do to you? They also go almost too subtle with his design and make him as close to a regular looking guy as Clayface can be, and I really didn't like that. It's the same kind of treatment many of the villains get in the live action movies, where the filmmaker wants everything to feel grounded and realistic, which I can accept in that medium, but in animation, I feel you have an advantage in being able to show the unrealistic and the more colorful, weird aspects to these characters that you simply couldn't do 
in other mediums. It's something they again nail with Catwoman, which is full-on Golden Age schlock, and also with Penguin, who is this giant, absurdly dressed, Lady Domestro kind of character. Those were a lot of fun, if not a bit short-lived, so it's not like they can't go that weird direction, but most of the villains just look and act too grounded and too normal. Which is really frustrating because the show clearly has no issue indulging in weird supernatural elements. I mean, Batman fights a ghost via exorcism in this show, so it's not like they're trying to be realistic, but the villains still feel just a bit too bland and unrealized, and far, far too subtle. Even the fun one-off joke character Onomatopoeia is like criminally underused and forgettable. Dun, dun, dun. It's a shame too because they had the balls to change up a lot of these characters for a fresh new take despite knowing that people would bitch and moan about it no matter how good they made it. That's something I can really respect, but only if it works. Which I think it did with Penguin aside from the terrible name, I mean Oswalda, give me a break. And also with a few of the other tweaks characters like Catwoman got, like her coming from money and having her own Alfred, that was cute, and then Clayface being this old Bella Lugosi type guy. Title off. Sidekick. Fuck you! I can get behind all of that, but Harley Quinn, for example, I think totally falls flat. As if we didn't already have a mass oversaturation of the regular Harley Quinn, now we have yet another version of her that's just much less interesting. I don't believe you. They keep the same general background with her being a psychiatrist and even use that as an excuse to have her and Bruce have sessions where she tries to break through his shell, which I loved and thought was a really clever way to use her, but when it came time for her turn as a villain, they just couldn't follow through. I'll answer all your questions later, but we gotta go, now! Now, I thought it was going well initially because it had a nice setup with scenes of Harleen being openly disgusted by her rich clients, followed by the reveal that she had been slowly kidnapping and brainwashing them. That all worked for me, and I thought it fit well with the themes of greed and corruption that plague Gotham. It makes sense to have a villain represent that part of the city. I also liked how sinister she initially seemed to be with her methods of weird psychological torture she would use on her victims, but then it all totally falls apart when Batman gets involved where they tried to all of a sudden have us believe that she is a good person who is totally not insane, which she most certainly is. Welcome to my inpatient facility, Mr. Collins. I call it the playpen. They tried to have their cake and eat it too, where she is both this crazy, unhinged villain that dresses herself and her victims in these insane getups and tortures them, but also is just a good, nice person who is misguided. And sorry, you just can't do that in a 25 minute episode of TV. You gotta pick a lane, okay? We spend the entire first chunk of the episode seeing how crazy she is and how much of a threat she could be, so you just naturally think that it's building to some major confrontation with Batman, or even possibly Bruce Wayne since he too fits her model for one of her victims, which would have been a really cool direction to take the episode, but then when he shows up to confront her, she doesn't want to kill him, or unmask him, or talk to him, or trade barbs about their ideologies, or use her psychological skills on him to pick his brain and maybe also bring him under her control. Nope, she just wants to delay him for a bit while she escapes because, God forbid, one of our villains tries to kill Batman. She's even such a good person that she goes back to save her friend and supposedly gets herself killed in the process. Look, I don't want to kill you, but I need to give myself a head start so your hero complex doesn't bite me in the hiney. Also, any connections to the usual version of Harley just make her character seem unfocused and messy. Like, they kept her quirky, bubbly personality as a regular person, but make her so stoic as Harley Quinn that it felt like two entirely different people, which maybe could have worked if it was like some split personality thing, but they didn't do that, so it just didn't make any sense. Also, why does this character even do the Harley Quinn bit? 
It felt like she only dressed like that because that's what we expect from the regular Harley Quinn, but it makes sense for her to do that because she's the Joker sidekick and it fits with his whole Joker theme. But here, it's just never explained, so if you're somehow watching this without any knowledge of Harley Quinn, you would be totally confused as to why that's her bit. Mm, it was just such a bizarre, weird letdown where you had this semi-original villain that could have been a really nice foil for Batman as either a sadistic extreme version of himself that punishes those she believes to be evil or a more toned down anti-hero version of that character that could be framed as a relatively good person that could be reasoned with. Kind of like a phantasm type villain. Either way though, there just isn't much interaction between them as is to make anything work. Aside from their sessions in earlier episodes, they exchange maybe like two or three lines in costume, and when you take a swing like that with a character people love and it doesn't work, that's when you get some pushback from viewers, rightfully so, so I don't blame anyone for doing it. The kings don't run this court anymore, the jester does. That being said though, it's not all bad. Harley Quinn is certainly a major letdown and the general lack of screen time most of the other villains get doesn't help anything, but there are some bright spots, mainly in the character of Two-Face. Harley Dent, can we trust him? I did like what they did with Catwoman and most of Clayface and a few of the others, but Harvey Dent is what really saved this season from having no standout villain character. Mitchell's the new DA, good for Pete. <laughs> <laughs> he was always a smart, dedicated, hard-working, backstabbing little snake. I mean, it wasn't anything groundbreaking as we have seen great adaptations of Two-Face's origin before, but the way they weaved his rise and fall into the main narrative of the season made it hit that much harder. You saw him pop up most every episode as the charming DA he usually is, showing him to be a person that's already kind of a bad egg from the start. He's not evil or anything, but he's not a nice person. He carries himself as someone who is above others and someone people should kiss up to, for no other reason reason than to feed his ego as Gotham's future savior. A bit of friendly advice. Start caring. Because after election day, you'll want to be on my good side, Renee. He still has a strong sense of justice, but like most of Gotham's elite, he slowly succumbs to the corruption that infects every part of the city. Willing to throw out his ideals when doing it the quote-unquote right way doesn't work for him. Reform doesn't come cheap, Dent. You want my help? There's a price. You ask me, you're getting a deal here. I also loved that his acid attack was not a result of him going over the edge or letting his bad side take over, but the exact opposite. He's made into the monster he is, not by embracing the evil of the city, but by standing up to it after he almost went too far down the path of no return. So as a result, they do this amazing small change with him, where instead of his burned half being the bad side of his personality, it's actually the good half and the half you feel pity for. It's sad and self-aware and understands what is wrong with him, where his other half maintains the same arrogance and cynicism and hatred he had before he was burned. He goes extreme in both directions. I don't deserve this. Any of this. No. No. That's not... That's not right. I've done things. Terrible things. But didn't I... I pay for my sins? It's honestly kind of brilliant for such a small change and totally reshapes how you view that character. You don't see him as this deformed monster because the burned half just looks so sad and defeated and lost and human while his normal half is the part of him that's truly gone. It's great, but it's also why I found most of the other rogues such a letdown because you see what the show is capable of pulling off when they take the time to do it. And that right there is really the core issue with all the villains and how they are handled. Time. 
They nail the characters they can build and flesh out over the course of the whole season, but mostly fail to realize the ones that are only around for a single episode. Honestly, it makes me think they should just do away with the one-off villains entirely, or at least rework the structure of the show to not require a new one every single episode. I know that's kind of a uh, radical idea for a show like this, since that is the structure for literally every superhero show ever made, but the serialized format simply doesn't lend itself well to introducing a brand new bad guy every episode. It can be done in an episodic format, because then you have the full length of the episode in this perfect vacuum to build the main villain character, and only them, but in Cape Crusader, a good chunk of each episode's runtime, regardless of who the baddie is, is devoted to the greater narrative with the cops and Dent and Thorn and Flass and Bullock and all that because that is where the show's focus is. Where a show like the animated series would have the full 22 minutes devoted to just that episode's bad guy or premise, Cape Crusader only has like 15 or so of the 25 to devote solely to the one-off characters because they have to keep focus on the main serialized narrative. We gotta check in on Gordon and Montoya and Barbara and Flass and Bullock and all of them, so the villains often fall to the wayside of their own episodes. Ow. <laughs> I know it seems weird to imagine an animated superhero show not having a villain of the week, but I think that would make the ones they actually use that much better. Instead of trying to cram one in every episode, maybe have like one overarching main bad guy for a season like the Joker, or uh, one of the mob bosses like Thorn or Penguin, or just anybody that has goons, and then maybe like an assassin character like Deathstroke or Deadshot or a big bruiser like Croc that's in their employ, then uh, throw in some supernatural character like Clayface or Man Bat into the mix to shake things up, and maybe have an appearance from a possible love interest like Catwoman or Talia that can either assist him or be an adversary, and that's all you would really need for a 10 episode serialized Batman show. Around 4 or 5 villains. They should think of it more as one long movie rather than 10 standalone installments because that's essentially what the show is. They structured the whole show as as one long narrative and then went back and chopped it up and tried to make these standalone episodic installments. Batman and the cops in the main narrative exist in a serialized format, but the villains exist in an episodic format all in the same show. But that's not what the show should be. It's one solid thing, and when you think of it that way, there's no way you would think to shove a new villain in every episode, because of course you wouldn't. That would be ridiculous. One of the many advantages of doing a Batman show is you can pick and choose from a big old bucket of great baddies. Just reach on in there and take the ones you need. Might need a few A-listers, might just need a guy named Calendar Man, and that's it. It doesn't really matter. We've seen virtually every Batman villain adapted in some medium before, so there's no pressure to run through the gambit of every major bad guy. Just pick a few, do them well, and that's all you need. And hottest take of all here, you don't always have to use the Joker. Are you serious? I know they are in season 2 and that's fine because every Batman adaptation has to have the Joker, but you can mix it up and use a few of the other characters. Just saying. I'm looking at you, Matt Reeves. You can just leave that guy in his cell and do something else, okay? Maybe Poison Ivy or Mr. Freeze or Mad Hatter or the Court of Owls or, uh, you know, just anyone else. Please God, do someone else. Heads up, Chowhounds. Drop your forks and prepare to cower before the uncanny condiment king. I know I've rambled on for a while now about the villains, and it might seem like I have a bigger problem than I actually do with them, but that's really the only major complaint I have with Cape Crusader. And the villains aren't even that bad, really. I just found them so frustrating more than anything because they were so close to working, and I genuinely liked a lot of the changes they made with them, but they were all held back by these totally fixable issues. And again, they just weren't the main focus of the show's attention, so a lot of my complaints 
and start at a conceptual level of what a Batman show should be. So it's not exactly the end of the world here. And frankly, I'm willing to excuse the sidelining of the villains because the primary season long narrative they did focus on was pretty good. Again, leaning into that classic noir theme, the show's story is a very stripped down, grounded, simple tale of police corruption, murder, greed, deception, tragedy, and justice. It doesn't even require a superhero in it at all. It's all about examining everything wrong with this city and those few individuals who fight to save it even if it seems like a lost cause. You could have done better for me. I don't deserve to be here. Actually, I think you do. Gotham is the main character, and we see it explored through the people who for some reason choose to still live there. I'm frightened, that's what I think. I won't go out after dark now. This whole city's gone to hell in a handbasket. Barbara Gordon, for example, is a public defender in this version, and the show uses her as this inverse to Harvey Dent, where she believes there is always shades of gray and nuance in life, and the primary job of law enforcement is rehabilitation, Dent and her father have a much more cynical view of justice, basically accepting the system is broken and using it in Dent's case to make himself seem more noble by putting everyone he can behind bars, or in her father's case, viewing it as a form of punishment for those few few small fish the cops are actually allowed to catch. Inside here, people know the difference between right and wrong, they just do. So when they choose wrong, they should answer for it. You know it's not that simple, Dad. Well, it should be. All three of them are on the same side, but they all have different views on how the system works and how they can best use it to improve the city and their own careers. Hell, even the corrupt cops Flass and Bullock have a sense of doing justice. They just express it in a way they think is possible in a city like Gotham. Don't worry about Cohen on that pain in the ass kitty cat. The lady's running out of lives, trust me. She just doesn't know it yet. The show is always going back to this theme, showing all of them in and out of court and having them debate over how best to handle criminals and how much good the Batman is doing. Along with Montoya and of course Bruce, they're some of the last people left in Gotham that are actually on the side of real justice and because of that, they feel alone and hopeless and often end up putting themselves in real danger. In fact, you see them on the case and alone almost as much as you see Batman doing it, which is why they grow to respect him and become his ally, just as Batman does the same with them. They're all doing the same dirty work no one else would do. And as the season starts to unfold, you begin to realize that the main villains are not actually the standard rogues Batman usually deals with, but the corrupt cops and elites that act as the inverse of people like the Gordons and Montoya and even Harvey Dent. People like Flass and Bullock and Thorn. Those are the main bad guys for a Batman show, which sounds crazy since you're primary villain for the season is a one-off character from year one, a comic from like 40 years ago, but it really works. It ties back to what actually drove Bruce Wayne to become Batman in the first place. Not to stop insane supervillains, but to fight back against street-level crooks and thugs. And the show doesn't hold back in portraying them as truly awful people that pose a serious threat to our heroes. Flass and Bullock spend the entire season working to undermine any progress the good cops in Batman do, and in most cases, they actually succeed. The arc of the season ends not with any of the three of them or the corrupt mayor behind bars, but Dent ruined and killed, and the remaining good guys all on their own. It's actually kind of surprising because you don't expect these relatively small fry characters to be able to win against Batman and company because, you know, he's Batman. But going there only further illustrates how raw and inexperienced Batman really is, and also how sorry of a state Gotham is in in Bruce's early days as a crime fighter. I keep mentioning Year One, but the show so clearly takes an incredible amount of inspiration from it. In that story, Batman makes a lot of mistakes and gets his ass kicked a lot, and not by like Bane, but by common street thugs. He's not ready yet to bring down the house on the evil elites of Gotham. And while he's not nearly that raw in Cape Crusader, he's not the prime 
Batman we are used to seeing. He doesn't always save the day. Flash and Bullock are more than capable of getting one over on him and doing some real damage, which is shown perfectly in what I believe to be the show's best episode, Night of the Hunters. If you watch one single episode of Cape Crusader, it's gotta be this one. It puts on full display everything the show is trying to go for, and where it, at least for me, got me to buy into the show completely. Asking the question on everyone's mind these days, what do you think about the Batman? In the episode, the cops have been tasked by the mayor with putting together a task force to bring in the Batman after he was caught on camera in the previous episode, beating up Flass and Bullock to save Catwoman. So you get to see how the general public feels about Batman since this is his first time he's actually been caught on camera and talked about as being more than a myth. You see that the cops are only incentivized to catch him because of how inept Batman makes them look. Seeing them pour just an absurd amount of time and resources into this case while they actively neglect solving actual crimes. Also look, it's Lois Lane. Well, he's breaking the law, ain't he? So they ought to catch that freak and lock him up. The first half of the episode is just this cat and mouse game where the cops set up increasingly insane traps for Batman like fake muggings and fake car chases, which of course all end up failing because they totally underestimate him. But it's not all good news because the more the cops fail to catch him, the more pressure comes down for Gordon and Montoya who could lose their jobs if they don't succeed. So as the failures start to mount and the temperature under Gordon increases, Flass and Bullock decide to take take advantage and lure Batman out by releasing one of the costume freaks he seems so keen on chasing. In this case, Firebug, who I guess is a different character from Firefly, which is weird but uh, not important? Okay, let's go Firefly. It's time to take a ride. Actually, it's Firebug. Point being, they let him go, and as it turns out, the man is a raving pyromaniac, and they show it in its full horrific beauty as he begins to unleash fire on the city's slums. Can't you feel it? All of those people out there, longing for the flames. So, the climax of the episode is this chaotic mess of Batman trying to catch Firebug and save civilians while Flass and Bullock and their goons are trying to catch Batman, while Gordon and his team are trying to stop all parties and save people, and as you would expect, shit gets pretty wild. But what caps this episode off so perfectly is that it totally subverts what you expect to happen. As you watch it, you think, okay, clearly this is going way too far for Flash and Bullock and they are gonna get caught and thrown in jail and Batman is of course going to also stop Firebug because that's just how these shows play out. I mean, it's how it would in the animated series, but wouldn't you know it, none of that happens and in fact the total opposite occurs where Batman doesn't stop Firebug or the cops because he's too busy saving civilians. That way, go! What does happen is Bullock straight up murders Firebug and gets praised as a hero cop, leading to him and Flass taking over the Batman task force and undermining Gordon and Montoya's power. It's shocking because while they don't catch Batman, they still win. They don't get caught and don't get brought to justice, and because of that, they are around to finish off Harvey Dent in the finale. Let me take a wild guess. Was that about us? It's amazing. It's everything great about the show wrapped up in one episode. The buildup of the serialized narrative, the focus on Gotham's corruption, the minimization of the classic supervillains, the dark, dreadful tone, the balls to kill off a real named character in Firebug. It even shows how much of a hero Batman is by having him forego the big juicy targets in favor of saving innocents from the fire. A choice that shows both his heroism and also gives him a direct consequence for making that choice in the form of Flass and Bullock being rewarded. He's still cold and distant and a bit off-putting, but you see him be a real hero amongst the chaos. The
The only other part of the season that matches the quality of this episode is the finale where Harvey completes his arc by sacrificing himself to save Barbara and Bruce comes so close to killing Flass since his failure to stop him earlier in the season directly led to his friend being murdered. So you get this incredible moment where Bruce actually picks up a gun and you think he's going to use it but he maintains to his ideals and chucks it in the ocean. It's an appropriately hopeless moment where you see Bruce pushed to his absolute limit as nothing he's done seems to have mattered at all. If people like Flask can openly gun down someone in front of the police commissioner and Batman, then how much hope is there? Is his crusade doomed to fail? Hey, 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 hold on. That was a right to shoot. You can't do this. You're just some lousy vigilante. I'm a goddamn cop! It's moments like this that, for me at least, makes me such a huge fan and defender of this show. It's willing to show Batman not only incredibly flawed and unlikable, but also show him fail and be overwhelmed. He's at the same time this mythical, mysterious, otherworldly figure, and also just a man. Which to me is the core of all Batman media and what makes that character so interesting. He's terrifying and brutal and closed off, and at times comes off hard but he's still very much a good person that wants to help people. He's just simply too damaged to express it in the same way a character like Superman does, where he seems to actively get joy out of being a hero and doing the right thing. In short, the show just gets the character of Batman. It understands exactly what makes him tick, and more importantly, what makes Gotham City and the psychos who, for some reason, still choose to live there tick. It's not perfect and could do with some longer episodes, or at the very least a few more episodes of the same length, but frankly, that's a thing that all TV has an issue with these days. But at the end of the day, it's still one of the best early year Batman stories out there, which is saying something, because again, we have a whole lot of Batman content fed to us. And between this and Matt Reeves' Batman, I'd say we've been eating pretty good lately. Might have to wait a bit for the uh, video game side of things to not be embarrassing, but hey, you know, can't win them all. I have no idea why WB let this show slip through their fingers, but hey, based on their recent choices, perhaps it's for the best if they're not in control of this one.